I want to begin with two questions that are unrelated to Ukraine, finish with Ukraine. The first comes from the Washington Post. Their third story on that, on the website this morning is, the teens fighting to keep Yunkin's trans policies out of their school. It goes on to talk about the, uh, the kids who keep showing up in Virginia Beach asking that Ralph Northam's policy be returned to allow students to play in all sports and to dress in either locker room in which they identify. So I did some research. There are, according to the LGBTQ database, 723 uh, self-identifying trans students in the state of Virginia. There are 22,000 students in the state of Virginia in academic clubs. There are 174,000 students in athletics. What is wrong with our media, Senator, that we spend so much time? I'm very compassionate towards family and children who think they're a gender than they're not. But I just don't understand why we focus so much on this. Well, Hugh, the problem with the media is that it's become an open wing of the Democratic Party. Those numbers you just laid out are stark. The Washington Post bans the ramparts on behalf of an issue that is a very small niche issue in which public opinion, and including teen opinion, I'm quite sure, in the state of Virginia strongly sides with Governor Yunkin's common sense approach that uh, students, especially girls, need uh, to have uh, sports that are fair to them where they can compete against other girls, and they need privacy when they go to the bathroom. Um, But the Washington Post, as I said, is just a wing or an extension or an arm of the Democratic Party, as is most traditional media sources. Um, And therefore, they read like uh, email newsletters from the Democratic National Party or their left-wing activist groups. Except they include my column, and then that gets all those people to, to engage and comment negatively. All right, Senator, I just think it's crazy. Second crazy story is from the Wall Street Journal. Headline, $100 a barrel oil is the Fed's next challenge. Well, here's a bulletin. No, it's not. It's Joe Biden's challenge. Am I right or is the Wall Street Journal headline right? (laughs) No, Hugh, you're right. Um, I mean, it's a challenge in the sense that it's going to add inflationary pressures to our economy that are already pressing against it when you're up to $95 a barrel and Gas is starting to bump back up against four dollars a gallon, but this is not the Fed's fault. This is Joe Biden's fault. Uh, the president has repeatedly waged a war on oil, and not just oil, on coal and gas as well. And it's not surprising that Americans are paying record high prices for gas and electricity, and um, and soon to be gasoline as well. Um, I mean, just in recent weeks, he has taken out uh, of um, the realm of exploration and production, places that are actually in something called the National Petroleum Reserve, you. Um, yeah. And at every, tur- at every turn, his administration is trying to make it harder to produce American oil and gas and coal um, while they're continuing to subsidize Chinese manufactured wind and solar power, as well as electric vehicles that are too expensive and don't suit the needs of most Americans. Now, I, I want to point out to people, of the major oil producers in the world, there is Russia, our enemy, Iran, our enemy, Saudi Arabia, our estranged ally that Joe Biden can't figure out if he hates or likes, and us. And the only one that could offset the production cuts in the first three is us. And we're not doing that, Senator. And so obviously the, the cost of oil is going to go up. No, we're not at all. Um, again, yeah, Joe Biden, again, is, is undertaking every effort he can to hamstring American energy sources. And it doesn't just stop at our borders either. You, you mentioned Saudi Arabia, our strange ally. Um, to the extent they are estranged, it's because Joe Biden and the Democratic Party has waged a campaign against Saudi Arabia for five years. Remember, in the political campaign of 2020, he said that he would ostracize them and make them a pariah. Um, so we shouldn't be surprised if, if we treat our friends like their adversaries, that they are not as comes to taking actions that would help us and would help the rest of our allies around the world. Uh, Along that line, that get- the, uh, a huge story today is did India order the assassination of a Sikh separatist in Canada, and Canada has asked us to join them in, in condemning India for doing so. We've refused to do that but my, because Joe Biden cares about Modi and the relationship with India more than he does about one activist. 
isn't that exactly the opposite of Joe Biden's position on Saudi Arabia and the murder of the uh, Jamal in in the Turkish embassy by bone saw? Well, without getting into into the underlying facts of the allegations to you about which I, I'm not going to comment, I, I will say that the key dividing line when you're dealing with any government should be very simple. Are they pro-American or are they anti-American? Um, and Saudi Arabia, just like India, has been largely pro-American for decades. Saudi Arabia in particular, um, going back to what was uh, made in the 1940s, the side with the United States as against Soviet Russia. Um, but under Joe Biden, for that matter, under Barack Obama, the Democratic Party, um, has a campaign to ostracize Saudi Arabia, and then they act shocked when Saudi Arabia is, is somewhat miffed and, and won't listen to their entreaties to raise oil production right before the midterm elections. Uh, what we need to do to these countries is thank them for being aligned with America, to work out our differences privately and diplomatically when those differences arrive, and to give them the assurances they need that, for instance, when Iran shoots missiles, into their countries, we are going to be there and stand with them steadfastly. I want to close with Ukraine. You are one of the clear-sighted um, voices in Congress on Ukraine. The Republican House caucus is split over to aid to Ukraine. If they had the attackums and the F-16s, this offensive would be over and would have succeeded. They don't have the attackums and they don't have the F-16. Do you favor getting them to them in the next appropriation? Well, Hugh, what I agree with all House Republicans, I know, whether they've supported or opposed military aid to Ukraine in the past, is that Joe Biden did much to tempt Vladimir Putin to go for the jugular in the first place by granting one-sided concessions to Vladimir Putin and uh, showing weakness in 2021. And he has certainly prolonged this war and made it bloodier than it had to be by his continued refusal to simply provide Ukraine the weapons that they needed to fight and defend their territory. And we're still in this cycle of refusal, hesitation, reconsideration, and then flip-flopping. Um, I called last week for the president to provide the long-range long missiles, Army tactical missile systems, also known as ATACMs, so Ukraine could hold at risk all of those supply and logistics depots that are on Russian-occupied Ukraine territory. It would be much easier to breach defensive lines if the Russian soldiers at the front of those lines didn't have secure supply depots behind them, providing them ammunition and shells and so forth. So if Joe Biden had simply followed what Richard Nixon did in the Yom Kippur War, which is to send everything that shoots on everything that flies, this war would have ended a long time ago. There's still time. Ukraine is getting through those defensive lines. They're making steady gains, not as fast as they would like or that you and I would like. Um, but we should simply provide them the weapons that they need to defend their own country and to show Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping that the world will not tolerate wars of unprovoked aggression. Last question, Senator. Uh, last week we talked about a Wall Street Journal poll that showed even a majority of Democrats didn't want President Biden to run because of his age. Since then, the CBS News poll offered only 33 percent. Only a third of Americans think he would finish a second term. I know what your position is, but let's reiterate this. You, you've dealt with the the, the president, when he was vice president, you've followed his career for a long period of time. He should not run. Are you in favor? Has the infirmity gotten to the point where you're in favor of 25th Amendment sort of stuff? That's up to him in the cabinet. It's not up to you. But what do you think? Well, no, Hugh, you're right. It's up to, to his cabinet and ultimately to him. But I think it's obvious to anyone's eyes and common sense that Joe Biden's too old to be president today, much less for five plus more years. Um, and Democratic voters, even though we don't necessarily agree on a lot of issues, have eyes. And some of them have common sense, and they can see that as well. And it's uh, you know, quite notable how the Democratic Party doesn't want Joe Biden to run for re-election, yet the Democratic Party elite are circling the wagons to protect him and insulate him from their own voters to the greatest extent they can. Why did they move? Uh, their opening caucuses and primaries from Iowa and New Hampshire. They were worried their voters in those states would repudiate President Biden just like they did in 2020. So they've taken every step possible, like a phalanx of bodyguards, to surround Joe Biden, not from Republicans, Hugh, but from their own Democratic Party voters. So here's my closing question. I look at the Democratic field, and I expect 
President Biden to step aside after he wins in South Carolina, sort of a balm to his ego, and then throw it open. And then I expect the vice president to run, but I also expect Gavin Newsom to run, Jared Polis, maybe Josh Shapiro. That's a bit of a reach. Roy Cooper. Who do you think would present the greatest formidable obstacle to whomever the Republican nominee is looking like Donald Trump right now? But that can, of course, change. No matter who we nominate, who would be the best Democrat to run? And you would think presents the greatest challenge. Well, I'm not going to answer your question uh, for two reasons. One, um, I think it's risk in politics to try to predict who would be the easiest person to beat. There's no better example of that than the Democrats and Hillary Clinton pining away for Donald Trump in 2016. And two, I don't think it really matters all that much, whether it's Joe Biden or Kamala Harris or Gavin Newsom. All of these politicians have mortgaged their convictions entirely to the far left in America, and they're all going to pursue the kind of highly ideological uh, policies if they were ever to become president that Joe Biden has. That's why it's so important that once we have a nominee, our party rally behind that nominee and do what's necessary to persuade independent and swing voters and turn out Republican voters to win next fall. Uh, Senator Cotton, I greatly appreciate your being with me this morning. Keep coming back and, uh, and go around the Senate and find Senator uh, Scott for me and tell him if he says he's done a show, he's got a show. Uh, because he didn't. Uh, I appreciate your taking the time with me. You go have a good day, Senator.